Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's community Q&A with the uh, RMWB. I'm Adam Hardiman with the municipality, and I'm joined today once again for our third day in a row, Mayor Don Scott, our Director of Emergency Management, Scott Davis, our Chief Administrative Officer, Jamie Doyle, and our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, Matthew Huff. So glad you could join us once again as we try to do our best to answer all the questions you might have uh, from the flood impact and our river breakup 2020 season. Get your questions in. You know how to do it probably by now, but go right to that comment box right below uh, the, the video, the live feed, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible today. Of course, the last few days we have over thousands of people on the line, so we do our best to get to everybody's question. But we're not going to be able to, of course, as you can appreciate, but we'll try to group themes together based on what you want to know. Of course, you can always get update information about what's happening at rmwb.ca. You can even sign up for up-to-the-minute updates at rmwb.ca slash flood update. They'll go right to your inbox, right to your phone. Of course, follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and once again on the website. For up-to-date information about the rivers, rivers.alberta.ca is your best resource for the levels of water and the impacts that are happening on our rivers as we move through this together. And of course, um, you can always call the Pulse Line, 780-743-7000 for any general questions you might have. So get those questions in. Uh, more than happy that you're joining us here today. We'll be back again tomorrow. And of course, we also have our telephone town hall tonight beginning at 5.50 p.m. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, earlier we were focusing on COVID-19. We're going to shift that focus tonight to the impact of the flood and river breakup 2020. So if you haven't signed up for that, you can do so at our website. You may be already on that call out list. So we look forward to hearing from you later if that's uh, another way you want to connect with the municipality. So before we get to your questions as they come in, we're going to have some uh, opening remarks. First, I'd like to invite Mayor Don Scott to say a few words. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. So I want to begin just by thanking once again all those who were involved in the evacuation. We have had a lot of people who have been assisting in this process. If you happen to see one of them or meet one of them, please give them a shout of thanks. Uh, you know, there's there's been a lot of challenges in this community, and we could not get through these challenges without all the volunteers, all the first responders, all the municipal staff who are still making sure essential services are performed and all those who are working in the emergency services department so please make sure you give a shout out to everybody that you encounter who is you know working hard to make sure that this community stays safe and that you're all protected so there's a few updates i want to make sure that i give so last night i had a discussion with murray crawford he runs the hospital so there was an initial plan to move seniors from the hospital and what uh, murray crawford assured me is that that plan is now on hold. They are no longer moving the seniors out of the hospital because the infrastructure at the hospital is extremely safe. Uh, the concern was never really that anybody would ever get wet at the hospital. The concern was that there is a mechanical room that is at the bottom of the hospital, right beside a manhole. The concern was that the underground services, because they're being overwhelmed right now by flood water, would come up through that and then potentially flood that mechanical room. So with a lot of efforts, uh, there were a lot of volunteers there one night, as many of you know. Uh, they circled that manhole cover with, uh, with sandbags, and there was also a pump put in that manhole that makes sure it's drained out. So, and that has been very effective. So when I talk to Chief, Fire Chief Jody Butts, he assures me that, uh, that the, there is almost no risk to that mechanical room now. So with that information and knowing Murray Crawford, uh, he indicated to me that they are not planning to move the seniors and our hospital is extremely secure. So please go away knowing that information. The other update I want to give you is from the first responders that I've talked to and the people on the front lines, they have told me that the water levels in town have receded significantly. I saw it in a few spots myself, but we're talking several meters, uh, not down, but in roads, it's receded back. So there's a lot of positive signs. Uh, the ice chunk, uh, Scott Davis is gonna give a bit of an update, it has been melting. So we're seeing very positive signs in that regard as well. The other thing I wanna give everyone an update on is the call that I had with the prime minister. So he called yesterday. He was uh, extremely concerned about the community and uh, he initially expressed his uh, remorse over the, the death of the individual from Fort Mackay. And then we talked about what this community is experiencing. It's been through so many challenges. And a phrase that I used with the Prime Minister uh, that I think is very applicable is that this is a community that doubles down on hope. 
And I think that that's something that uh, we can all take uh, into account going forward. There is a lot to be hopeful for. You know, uh, we've been through many challenges. We're going to get through this challenge, and we're going to get through it extremely well. I made many asks of the Prime Minister, as I do every time I talk to him. M many of them are money-related and potential flood mitigation. Uh, there was no firm commitments given by the Premier, but or the Prime Minister, but I was very pleased to have the discussion, and uh, we're going to be following up with the federal government, and, and we're, we're going to keep asking. I was very, very pleased to see the commitment by the government of Alberta yesterday. There's lots of information out about that. Uh, I'm very thankful to Premier Kenny, who is uh, not only talking about giving money, but he's, uh, he's putting money up, and that's $1,250 per evacuated resident, and another $500 if there's a dependent child. So that's all very helpful. And as for the municipality itself, I think everyone's aware, we are paying the costs of those who registered at the evacuation centers. We're paying the costs of food for those who are registered at the evacuation centers and at, at the hotels. So there's a, a you know, we're, we're covering a lot of costs. That, a lot of that is gonna be reimbursed later by other levels of government. So please stay safe, uh, you know, and please protect each other. We're gonna get to a lot of questions, I hope, today. The one thing that's been coming as a question several times to me is, when will the boil watery advisory be lifted? And I spoke to uh, Matthew Huff, our, who's going to be uh, another person answering questions today, and it's going to be a matter of weeks. Uh, so it's going to be a few weeks, that we think, before we get through this boil water advisory. So I'd like you all to take that into account. As I said yesterday, I went to each of the grocery stores. There is plenty of food, including water. Uh, the, one of the stores went through 35 pallets of water a couple of days ago, but they have lots of water coming up the road to stock this community. So I just want everyone to be aware of that, uh, and please stay safe. We are going to get through this. We're going to get through the challenge, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Good afternoon. Earlier today, I was joined by Jen McManus from the uh, Red Cross. She's the VP of uh, uh, Alberta Northwest Territories. And together with uh, Mayor Scott, we formally announced a major partnership between the RMWB and the Canadian Red Cross. Having 18 years experience with the Red Cross, I'm thrilled with this partnership that they've joined us. This partnership will con ensure evacuees receive the support they need through evacuation and recovery period. Longtime residents will recall that the Red Cross played a pivotal role during the Horse River wildfire. By registering with the Red Cross, evacuees are provided with a range of assistance, including information, referrals, lodging coordination, food and basic needs, safety, wellness support, and re-entry help when it's time to return home. All residents under mandatory evacuation are encouraged to register by calling 1-800-863-6582 between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. You can find these details on the rmwb.ca website. Residents who have checked in at the registration center will also need to register with the Red Cross. Registration ensures people are accounted for, can be contacted a while away from home, and can be reached for help. Evacuees don't currently need accommodations or immediate support are asked to register in a few days from now so we can ensure that most in need can access support as quickly as possible. We're getting a lot of questions about when people can go home or return to their businesses. I have a team working around the clock planning re-entry. I'd like to remind everyone that although water levels may be dropping, the river hasn't broken. River breakup has not, has not been declared. These areas still pose a risk due to fluctuating water levels, scattered debris, and damaged infrastructure. We continue to access damage, and I can assure you that residents and local business owners will be given access to their properties as soon as possible and safe to do so. We remain in the response phase and focused on ensuring that the community members re receive the support they need while they're out of homes. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Scott, and thank you, Mayor Scott, as well, for those opening remarks. Just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, go to the, I guess, comment uh, boxes or page right below the live video. Of course, this video in its entirety will be available on our RMWB social media platforms uh, following today's event, just like the last few. You can check out Wednesdays or Thursdays. There's still some relevant information, but we always remind you to stay up to date at rmwb.ca. You get those sign-up updates at rmwb.ca slash flood update. I, I, good. Scott covered up my existing notes, so I'm glad that I remembered that one. So way to go, right? Uh, so we're just going to start out here. We had a question from Sheila, and I'm going to just take the answer because it's very, very important at this time. Sheila's asking, could you provide a link that's shareable from the food bank so people can donate? So I'm just going to take that myself, uh, and thank you to the team for providing it. So anyone that would like to do that for up-to-date drop-off locations, you can also make donations online as well. You can go to woodbuffalofoodbank.ca slash donations. So that's whether you'd like to see whether those up-to-date locations are, of course, the food bank uh, flooded during this uh, very difficult event, uh, but they're, they're reset up out on Airport Road. So thanks to the community for making that happen. So woodbuffalofoodbank.ca slash donations. Um, you can see the, the locations where food can be picked up and dropped off as well as if you'd like to make a donation. So the next question is going to be for the uh, director of emergency management. I'm going to try to pair a, a couple different questions here if we can, uh, kind of the same theme. So questions from Lynn, uh, when can residents living in the Northwest end of Fraser Avenue go home? It wasn't necessarily flooded. Will parts of downtown, this is from Stephanie, be open soon? I, for example, the unaffected areas. From Terry, our house is not flooded. When can we go home? From Olive, when can parts of the lower town site go back? It was never flooded. Okay, so I think those are the ones uh, related to that uh, theme. So Scott, maybe you could speak a little bit to what's coming up next, where we are now, what that process is for various levels of property in uh, response and then re-entry. Thank you. So currently we have five teams that are doing assessments in the lower town site. What they're looking for are residences and businesses that have been impacted by overland flood water, as well as areas that may seem dry, however, due to uh, the storm sewers and the backups may have basements that have been significantly uh, impacted by flood waters. And we want to be sure that we're doing the assessments. Those teams comprise of ATCO gas, ATCO electricity. We have building inspectors as well as uh, public health inspectors that are all evaluating whether these houses and businesses are safe to get into. Once that's completed, what will happen is we'll take a measured approach in getting people back into their homes and businesses. What you'll find are placards that are on your doors and they will indicate uh, the colors uh, and information that you'll need to get back into your homes. My personal goal to all businesses and, and residents is we want to get you back into your homes and businesses as quickly as possible, but I'll always err on life safety first. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that, Scott, and obviously a common theme and a question we're getting from a lot of residents right now, both uh, here, uh, I presume on our telephone town hall coming up at the Pulse Line, so thank you very much, and thank you everyone for those questions. Our next question is, once again, uh, we're going to go to uh, water safety, the Boyle Water Advisory. Before I do that, Matthew, uh, I'm gonna, we're getting a lot of questions, and of course we are, because we live in Fort McMurray and Wood Buffalo. One of the big things is, how, much, how can I help? How can I get involved and how can I help the community? That's something we're hearing. So align with the incredible spirit of our residents. So we'll just sum it up as how can we sign up to volunteer? And I just want to remind everybody, you can go to woodbuffalovolunteers.ca if you want to help out. They'll, they'll, that the resources are available there, and um, they will be able to have that conversation with you and direct you uh, to where that volunteering can take place. So thanks again for that great community spirit. It's been amazing to see the outpouring, uh, not only from our first responders, staff, and people working directly on this response, but the volunteers and partners in the community that have come together uh, amidst the backdrop, of course, of COVID-19 as well. So we're going to go to those questions, Matthew. Um, Matthew Huff, of course, our DCAO. So I'll ask all three, and then you can come up and maybe speak to the, to the situation. Uh, this question's from Donna. 
Has the water been tested from the water treatment plant? Are there issues with microorganisms being in the water? Is that why the boil water advisory is on? And we also have a question from Ansley. Uh, Judging by many shared photos, the water treatment plant was not flooded. Why are we still in a boil water advisory? And when will this be lifted? And a third question about water from Donna. What about washing your hands with the water from the tap? Is that safe? And is it safe to shower? So I'll ask Matthew Hoffer, DCAO, to come answer those questions. Thank you. Good day, everyone. The uh, water is uh, uh, processed through the water treatment plant. Uh, You are not wrong that the water treatment plant uh, was not underwater, but the water uh, that uh, was in storage was impacted by the high uh, water levels. As far as the specific guideline that is not being met by our treated water, it's known as turbidity. In layman's terms, that would be how clear the water is. And at the moment, uh, as you would see by turning on on your tap, looking in your toilet, uh, it's not clear. Uh, Testing is ongoing. And what residents will start to uh, to notice, particularly in Timberley, uh, is an additional taste of chlorine. Now, this is safe. Uh, The additional disinfection is not at a level that uh, is deemed unsafe, but the flushing will ensure that uh, as days go by, the water will become clearer and clearer. But don't uh, let that uh, fool you. Please continue to follow Alberta Health Services guidelines. Boil your water before consuming it. It is safe to use to wash your hands, particularly with soap, and uh, it is safe to shower. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everyone, for those questions about water. Obviously, uh, the AHS boil advisory is still in effect for uh, the listed communities. You can check out that information at rmwb.ca. So, Mayor Scott, I'm going to go to you for this next uh, set of questions. And I know you spoke uh, earlier today as well as yesterday about your visits to all grocery stores uh, north of the bridge that remain open uh, here in Fort McMurray. So this question is from Zakaria, and then we have another one from Ansley. Uh, Zakaria asks, now that we have only three grocery stores in town, I think we might have one more. I live north of the bridge, but that's okay. Uh, Shouldn't we have them open 24 hours to minimize crowding? And from Ansley, what about the idea of pop-up grocery stores? So, Mayor Scott, I'm going to let you weigh in on that one. Uh, Some interesting thoughts there. Uh, Great questions. So, I visited every grocery store north of the bridge, uh, which was four, and, sorry, five. Uh, We had Independent, we had Save-On Foods, there's two Save-On Foods, we had uh, Sobeys, so, one, two, three, four, I think I've got them all. So, I visited everyone. Uh, it's been one of those days. And I, I spoke to everyone about whether their inventory was going to be adequate to make sure that they had enough supplies to make sure that they were looking after the residents of this region. And they all assured me that uh, all they've done is increase their orders uh, significantly uh, to make sure that they have adequate supplies. Now, they might run out of an item or two for a short time, but they have more items coming up the highway. Uh, you know, if, if uh, as we go forward, if people have innovative ideas about pop-up grocery stores or other ideas, then I think we would take that into account. Uh, and if there's enough demand, it's so- certainly something uh, that I can raise with the grocery stores themselves. Now, remember the grocery stores are impacted by the floods, just like many other businesses. They have individuals who are staying in camps. Uh, several of the grocery stores talked to me about individuals who were staying in camps uh, who were their employees. So that they're struggling uh, making sure they have enough employees sometimes as well. So that's another issue that's being taken into account. So there's a lot going on at the grocery stores. But the main theme I want to make sure that everybody understands is there are adequate supplies and there are adequate supplies coming up the highway to restock the supplies that are purchased. So there is no need for anyone to go out and buy everything. It's, uh, it's going to be well restocked for people to purchase as you go forward. Well, making sure that we maintain all of our safety precautions. So we just uh, almost had a little spill there, but we're okay. So Mayor Scott's okay. I'm okay. Everything's going to be all right. So thank you for uh, for understanding. 
So our next question is from Donna, and I'm going to go to our Director of Emergency Management, Scott Davis, for this. Donna asks, what about COVID guidelines being relaxed? I know I'll let the the Dems speak to this, but I think the relaxation was for those working in immediate first response, not the general guidelines. So just to be clear on that, but I'll continue the question. I'll let him weigh into those details. Now we have groups of kids hanging out in skate parks. Doesn't this waste time? So I'll ask Scott to come forward with that one. Thank you. We continue to work in an environment that's very risky, and we have to be aware that COVID can impact our uh, response uh, rec- and recovery actions. So working with our bylaw and our CMP, we continue to follow the guidelines from AHS, and uh, having uh, congregations of people that are in parks or uh, other areas and not following those guidelines only adds to the potential of spreading COVID. So we continue to follow the guidelines. We want to continue to f- enforce those and I really encourage residents, don't forget the work we've done over the last few weeks in trying to flatten the curve. That threat is still within the community and we have to be cognizant of that. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. And thank you, uh, Donna, for the question. Certainly, uh, we're dealing with two states of local emergencies, uh, one being a global pandemic we haven't seen in 100 years, and one being a, a flood event and river breakup that we haven't seen in 100 years. But we'll get through it as a community. Our next question is from Alana, and there's also a similar question from Ian. So I'm going to try to group those together, given the volume of questions that we have coming in. I'm also going to go to Scott, our Director of Emergency Management, for this one. So Alana is saying or asking, will we be told which structures are impact, impacted and which ones weren't? And Ian asks, how would you know if they were affected if you can't get into the homes without the homeowners? So maybe you can speak to that rapid uh, damage assessment that was just completed. I know that we're looking at, um, I think it was just over 1,200 structures that we had anticipated had, had some level of damage. If you look at the Horse River wildfire, and the mayor and I have spoken about it a few times today with, with media, you were about 12, 12, sorry, 2,579 structures. So the impact is about half, of course, a different situation than the 2016 Horse River wildfire. But just to give you an idea of the, the, the level or the severity of this uh, historic event. So I'll ask uh, Scott to come forward and speak uh, to that rapid damage assessment and uh, how we know certain structures are affected at this time. Thank you. Part of the assessment is looking at the flyovers and the mapping that was done as well as photographic that gave us a history as the progression of uh, water and ice came up and into the community. Uh, We continued to map that out and uh, as it has uh, receded, uh, we followed that as well. So we've got photographic evidence of a sort that shows us which uh, buildings, whether they be uh, residential or commercial, were impacted. Uh, What we don't know were the ones that were impacted through storm sewer backups. Uh, As our rapid assessment team is going around, and those experts include uh, uh, ATCO Gas, ATCO Electric, uh, building inspectors, public health inspectors, they're doing an outside visual check. They can't check the inside. However, there's indicators such as foundation that it might have uh, uh, sunken or uh, shifted in somewhat and certainly those p- provide a uh, threat to uh, uh, life safety. Uh, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Ian, as well as Alana, for those questions. A reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, just go to the comment box boxes, I guess, right below the live video. The live video in its entirety will be posted following our Facebook Live Q&A event today at rmwb.ca and uh, sorry, at the RMWB RMWB Facebook page. Really struggling with that one. So we're going to go on to a question from uh, Sonia and I think I'll just take this one um, because we really don't know the answer, although we know to where to direct you to get the answer. Sonia is asking, do we have an educated guess for the date on our mail service to be up and running again? So you have to visit CanadaPost.ca. Uh, their main facility was impacted. In a way. It's, it's downtown if you, did, if you weren't aware of that. So go to CanadaPost.ca. They'll be the ones providing the update. But we do know that your mail uh, is safe. It is secure. Uh, and they will be uh, letting all of us know in the community when they're in a position where they can get back up and running and get that mail to you. So I uh, don't have a, uh, an estimate on date, but check back with them. They'll have the best idea when that can happen. I'm going to go to our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for this question. Uh, question is from Kevin. 
Uh, Kevin is asking, um, if it's only a turbidity issue and we have disinfectant in the water, why are we boiling water to remove turbidity? So just go to um, Matthew Hoffer, DCAO, for that one. Thank you for the question. I don't want to understate the importance of following a boil water advisory. Uh, turbidity uh, of water uh, can be an indicator of, uh, of other uh, contaminants uh, in a water supply. Uh, we are, however, uh, working very quickly to return the water uh, to its normal pristine condition. And uh, again, uh, that's why you will notice that, uh, uh, that uh, chlorinated taste. Um, Alberta Health Services uh, also uh, provides some additional uh, guidance to uh, go the uh, extra mile. And I think uh, during a period of COVID-19, uh, this uh, is good advice that you could also use water from tap to wash your hands plus hand sanitizer. Or you could indeed uh, use the boiled water uh, um, for that uh, purpose as well. So just a little bit more uh, information uh, to be uh, uh, additionally uh, uh, safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. And thank you uh, once again, Kevin, for that question. So we'll move on to the uh, next set of questions here. Uh, these ones are related to... Um, Sorry, to the ice and water levels. So it's kind of misread that. So this one is from Linda. Um, she says, cl the clear water seems to still ha have a lot of ice. Is there a chance of more flooding? So I'll, I'll get, uh, have Scott give us an update on that. We do know that uh, in the last 48 hours, um, water in all the rivers has uh, receded. But of course, we're still in a very uh, volatile situation, very serious situation. Certainly the Athabasca, I think, has been, uh, sorry, 2.71 meters the last 48 hours where the Clearwater River has been about 0.71 meters. So I'll, I'll let Scott speak to uh, what we're envisioning out on the rivers alongside Alberta uh, environment. Thank you for that. We continue to work with Alberta environment as we monitor the, the ice levels, uh, especially in the clear water. The concern I have, and it's shared by the, uh, uh, our operations team, is once that ice starts to break up, uh, it could possibly move down and further impact the lower town site. Uh, it may flow right through and not be a problem. However, uh, we haven't been able to measure what that risk is. But if that ice were to hang up uh, in the lower town site, it could cause additional flooding and certainly impact life safety. Uh, what I encourage you to do is, uh, for information about the rivers, uh, go to rivers.alberta.ca and they're keeping that website and the information up to date. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Scott. Thank you, uh, Linda, for that question. So we're going to go to a question here from uh, Jarrett. Uh, and and I don't, we're going to have to redirect you here, Jarrett, but we do want to take your question because it's an important one and one that's probably on some people's minds. Jarrett asks, now all prenatal ultrasounds are cancelled and you have to go to Edmonton. Is there something we can do to get another clinic up and running ASAP? It's probably a question that's best for Alberta Health Services. So we do know that the Alberta Health Services will be joining us tonight on uh, the telephone town hall. There will be three representatives on that call. That begins tonight at 5.50 p.m. So if you'd like to register for that, you can go to rmwb.ca uh, and sign up. If you were already on the call out list that we had for the telephone town halls related to the response to COVID-19 impacts, you'll probably still get that call. But if you'd like to log, uh, sign up for that, um, you can. That's at 5.50 uh, this evening or you can also contact them directly uh, for, for a response. But join us tonight if you'd like. But thank you for the question. So the next question is uh, about insurance. So I might uh, send this to our Director of Emergency Management or any of our panelists. And also maybe Mayor Scott could speak to some of our efforts as well following that initial response with uh, a provincial and federal government, some of those conversations that have been happening, just so the residents are aware of our, our, our knowledge of this. So the question is from Mark. What about people who don't have coverage? So, Mark, very good question. So, Mary, maybe you can go first, and then we can go from there. 
Yeah, I, I do anticipate that there are going to be many people that are either underinsured or have no insurance. Insurance is very uh, spotty, and it's hit and miss when it comes to this kind of uh, issue, when it's flood insurance. So the first thing I want people to do, if you have any kind of insurance and you're not sure, go talk to your insurance agent and double-check that point, because uh, you may not think you have it, and... Uh, Many insurance policies are not exactly written in plain English, so go see your insurance agent, uh, talk to them, and double-check that as a first point. For those that do not have insurance, we're going to be lobbying the provincial government, but in the meantime, we have the Red Cross that has come to town, and we are so grateful for their support. We will be hopefully getting a lot of support from the Red Cross. Uh, they will uh, hopefully be doing, uh, doing things that will assist those without insurance. Uh, there's a lot of other communities or a lot of other agencies that are coming to town. I, I heard last night that Samaritan's Purse was going to be coming to town, uh, and that's something I'm very supportive of, very excited to hear about. They do a lot of good work. I've talked to several of the pastors in town about that. So they are going to also assist, I believe, those who are uninsured or underinsured. Uh, so please check your insurance policy. Uh, and beyond that, uh, make sure that you're paying attention to see which uh, of the agencies, whether it's Red Cross or Samaritan's Purse or others, who might be available to assist you. Uh, in the meantime, once we get a sense of where the numbers are, we're going to be going to the provincial government and seeing what other assistance we can get. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Scott, and thank you for that very important question. Certainly something that's top of mind for us as we move through this. So I'm going to hold myself accountable here because this next question is from Jesse. And I know, Jesse, you asked this on our first uh, community Q&A two days ago, and we didn't get to it. So thank you. Uh, I remember it. Question from Jesse, and I'll go to our Director of Emergency Management for the response. See how accountable I was. Uh, Jesse asks, what are you doing with the stuff in the river? I wasn't able to close my door when being rescued by boat. Is that stuff just getting washed down the river? So maybe you can speak to that conversation, Scott, and um, what the process would be. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. We continue to work with uh, Alberta Environment and understanding that the natural debris that's in the water, uh, we don't want it to impact critical infrastructure, so we are tracking it. However, right now we're letting Mother Nature do what it does best. We're concentrating on debris management in our affected areas. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that, uh, Scott, and thank you for the question. Uh, next question is from Shannon in April. I think this is going to be an important one for our Director of Emergency Management as well. Uh, Shannon in April ask, Why can't Bell Crescent residents go home? There is no risk. It is higher than hospital, and the hospital wasn't evacuated. So, Scott, maybe you can speak to the, um, the safety uh, focus that still remains, the risk that still remains, because I think some people... Thankfully, because some of that receding water and some of the, the positive steps that have taken place have a viewpoint which is very positive. But maybe you can speak to the current status and why that's the case, why we're maintaining uh, those evacuation orders. I share your concern, and last night as I uh, traveled through the areas doing an assessment along with uh, Chief Butts, we looked at the areas that uh, looked high and dry, uh, understanding the, uh, the logistics of trying to let people in, and I can understand you've been displaced from your home, you're very passionate about trying to get back in. However, understand that this is uh, for your security. We want to be able to let people in in a very controlled manner. Just opening the gates and having everybody come back into a subdivision at once could potential uh, open up uh, situations that are a security and a safety risk. So uh, please have patience. Understand that we want to work with you, but we want to do this safely uh, with a security lens to it. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Shannon and April, and uh, thanks, Scott, for the response. So we've got about 25 minutes left to go. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do so in those comment boxes right below the main video. The video will be posted following our community Q&A today. 
uh, on our social media platforms. And of course, if you're interested in joining us for our telephone town hall, that's at 550 this evening, you can register at rmwb.ca or you may have been already getting the call out for our COVID-19 telephone town hall. So we hope you can join us at 550 this evening. Our next question is from Kayla. Kayla asks, when it comes to registering, where are we to register? Casman Center wouldn't let us yesterday because we have accommodations. Is the registration going to be part of the other emergency fund from Alberta or the Alberta government? So Scott, maybe speak about uh, some of those different registrations and what we're currently telling residents. Thank you. And as you can understand, there's a large amount of people that have uh, uh, want to register, and that's why we've engaged with the Red Cross. This is one of the things that they do great. So I really encourage people to register at uh, 1-800-863-6582 from the hours of 8 a.m., to 8 p.m. Mountain Time, where Red Cross will help you with that. Just the sheer volume of numbers uh, would have overwhelmed our Casman Center. And again, Red Cross, this is one of the things that they do very passionately and effectively. So that's why we've partnered with them. As well as starting May 4th, the government of Alberta, uh, if you go to goafundingalberta.ca slash emergency. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kayla, for the question, and thank you once again, Scott. I'm going to go to our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, Matthew Huff, for this uh, next two questions that I'm going to combine because they are related. So Justin asks, are sewers backed up if water hasn't reached home but very close? Uh, he's on Harden Street, I think, based on this. And then Ian also asks, I'm on the backside of Birch Road. The water never got to my home, but the sump backed up. When can I get back in there and start getting it cleaned up before damage is done. So maybe you can speak to that aspect of this, uh, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer Huff. Thank you for uh, for the questions. Uh, the uh, the damage survey that uh, the uh, 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 the incident commander spoke about uh, uh, earlier uh, will identify as much as possible at this moment uh, what homes may have been damaged by uh, sewers backing up. Uh, again, uh, this is why uh, it's so important to uh, uh, to to take these steps uh, to uh, to assess uh, the structures, the risks uh, to uh, the homeowners, and uh, figure out what needs to be done to get people back uh, into, uh, uh, into their homes. Um, my apologies. I think uh, I covered it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the question. Thank you, uh, Matthew, for the response. Uh, we're going to go to our next question. Uh, this one's from Ashley. I know, uh, Scott, you just spoke about this, but I think it's a, a theme that's on everybody's minds in the community right now as uh, the waters recede, but we still have some ice and the water levels are still very high. Uh, this question's from Ashley. Is there a possibility for more flooding or are we safe from more flooding? Thank you for that. Yes, there still is a risk for, of flooding. As ice cut breaks out from the clear water, which is upstream from uh, the lower town site, it could come down and uh, create a jam in the lower town site, which would effectively uh, reflood some of the areas that are already have uh, receded from. Uh, for information about the rivers, the best place to go to is rivers.alberta.ca. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ashley, for the question. Just to repeat, rivers.alberta.ca. That's rivers.alberta.ca. You can go to the map. A whole bunch of good information there about the water levels. Updated very regularly. Of course, we have seen a reduction the last 48 hours of uh, 2.71 meters in the Athabasca and a 0.71 meters, 71 centimeters in the clear water. So continue to monitor that as always. It's certainly a big uh, focus right now on that. Uh, this next question here, I don't have the name, uh, my apologies. Um, 
I think the question was specific about actual kind of food meals as opposed to maybe long-term items for the food bank. So the question is, is the food bank the only place accepting food donations? So I'm not sure, uh, Scott, we could take that. Certainly you can go to uh, the food bank's website. Their information is there about uh, how they can accept donations, uh, where the current locations for pick up and drop off are open. They were impacted, of course, by this event, but they are uh, up and running once again with the help of the community. So Scott, I don't know if you want to take that. Thank you. Understanding that the food bank is uh, reloc reallocated and uh, continuing to work, we are diverting uh, donations to the food bank and certainly want to support them. Also, another reason why we're working with the Red Cross is to effectively support um, agencies such as the food bank and other food donations uh, as required. Uh, thanks for that, Scott. Thank you for the question. We've about a little over 15 minutes remaining here in this community Q&A here on Facebook, our third one in a row. And of course, we'll be back tomorrow at the same time to take your questions as we work through this together as a community. So I'm going to go to uh, our Director of Emergency Management as well as Mayor Scott for this uh, question. Um, and it's a straightforward question, but I think we can speak to our efforts around security, policing, and making sure the community is secure, especially downtown. And Mayor Scott, maybe you can speak to your expectations on this. Uh, question is from Denise. Are people looting downtown? Hi, uh, and that's a great question. We were very concerned as mayor and council about that issue. So we, uh, we asked that strong measures be taken. Uh, we, I, I can tell you I contacted the RCMP, made sure they had enough resources. We've uh, talked to the RCMP in the front lines at the checkpoints. Uh, I was, I've been... Uh, uh, on those checkpoints talking to people there are uh, measures being taken if they see people wandering in or walking around to check and see who they are and what they are doing so efforts are being made to make sure it's secure uh, I believe that the downtown is secure uh, I've heard rumors and stories that there's uh, things happening but uh, the RCMP are assuring me that they are taking every measure within their power to make sure that our downtown is protected. And I, uh, I take that at their word. And I think Scott might be able to supplement that as well. Thank you, Mayor Scott. I'd like to personally thank the working relationship with the RCMP we have. Last night as I was down in the area doing an assessment with our fire chief, we witnessed a few people that were down and before we could even pick up a phone, the RCMP were very quickly engaging with those individuals. And I really appreciate the support from our superintendent and members of the RCMP throughout this incident. Uh, thanks so much, Scott, and uh, thank you uh, for the question. Certainly one that we're all paying attention to, and it's on the mind certainly of the people that have been evacuated and impacted. So this question is from Jason. I'm actually going to go back to Mayor Scott uh, for this one and potentially our Chief Administrative Officer, but I'll let Mayor Scott uh, go first. Uh, questions from Jason. I would like to know... Apologize for that. Uh, we had a technical difficulty, so we're back with you. So thanks for uh, sticking with us. Question is from Jason. I would like to know what the RMWB is going to do to prevent the surge of out-of-province contractors coming to, into Fort McMurray in times of hashtag stay home due to COVID-19. After the fire of 2016, there was fly-by-night contractors that came in, took advantage of people and their insurance claims and basically disappeared or went bankrupt. Mayor Scott, can you speak to that? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. It's an issue I've been talking about, it, and uh, you describe them as fly-by-night. I've, I've been describing them as ambulance-chasing contractors, people that uh, have no vested interest in this region want to come and take advantage of the people in this region. So as a municipality, we are taking every measure to make sure that we're hiring local. We actually issued a news release on that, and we've had great discussions with our local contractors and the leadership of those local contractors. And 
our, uh, our CAO is going to be speaking to that in a moment. But what I want to advise people is if you have insurance, you have a discretion to choose your own contractor. Just because an insurance company suggests that you get one contractor or another does not mean that you have to accept that. Do not feel that you must choose a contractor who does not have a vested interest in this region. You are going to get a much better job if you choose someone who actually cares about this region. So I would encourage everybody, if you're going to get a contractor, choose someone local. Uh, what did happen after the fire is people came in here, they took deposits, disappeared, or they did shoddy work, disappeared. So if you want to have quality work, make sure that you use someone local. That's something very important. I'm very passionate about it. I've been emphasizing it at every opportunity. So thank you for raising that. Spread the word. Uh, if, you have, if you're getting work done, whether it's through an insurance company or not, choose somebody local to get that work done. Thank you, Mayor Scott. I'd like to echo those comments as well. Uh, this is something near and dear to my heart. And just this morning, uh, I've had meetings with, uh, with our senior staff, uh, with the Chamber of Commerce, NABA, uh, with Buffalo Economic Development Corporation, and the Construction Association to have this very conversation. So if you're members of any of those, please reach out and start sharing some of your information, uh, name, contractor, uh, name, what you do and what you can do, so we can start compiling that uh, database. Uh, so when we do start this cleanup, we have a, a really good, robust uh, data set for information. Well, thanks very much, Mayor Scott. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jason, for that excellent question. And apologies once again for that technical difficulty. Hope uh, it came across okay out there. Uh, next question is from Matthew. And this is why I'm glad we actually have experts in the room because I'd be in no way, shape, or form be able to answer this. So I'm going to go to our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, Matthew Huff, because I think he can answer it. The question is from Matthew. It's not Matthew Huff, another Matthew. Do I have to boil my water if I have an RO system with UV sterilization? Thank you, Matthew, for the question. Uh, Home-based water treatment systems vary greatly uh, in their quality and effectiveness. Reverse osmosis uh, ultraviolet uh, units also need to be well-maintained. So at this moment, uh, my recommendation, the order from Alberta Health Services, is to continue to boil, 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 boil your water until the boil water advisory is lifted. Thank you. So I'm actually going to go to our CAO, Jamie Doyle, for this one, a question about housing and rent. Um, this question is from Jen, and I know that there were uh, announcements and regulations put out under COVID-19 by the provincial government about rent and uh, no evictions and things of that nature. Uh, this question is from Jen. Are people living in affected Wood Buffalo housing expected to pay their rent by tomorrow? when there's no idea when we'll return. So maybe your CEO can speak to that relationship with the Buffalo housing and uh, our thoughts on that. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Jen, for the question. I've had some conversations with uh, Wood Buffalo Housing, and uh, yes, you are going to have to pay your rent, unfortunately. Uh, as I'm aware, uh, as I understand, it does, it does negate some of their insurance. Uh, so you might want to reach out to Wood Buffalo Housing to have a further conversation and maybe gather some more information. Uh, thank you, Jamie, and uh, please feel free to reach out to us for additional supports. So we do have a number of support agencies uh, in the region, uh, so please connect with us if you need any assistance. Uh, we know it's a difficult time. Uh, this question is from Mark, and I'm going to go to either uh, Scott or Matthew uh, for this one. But a very good question. Mark's asking, what conditions did we have prior to the breakup that would have caused the flood? Are these abnormal conditions measurable or detectable? If we anticipate a flood condition, how can we be proactive to prevent the flood? So maybe I'll have uh, Scott speak about what conditions uh, were heading into uh, what happened, and then maybe Matthew can speak to some of the mitigation measures we, ha mitigation measures we have done and, and look to do in the future. Thank you. Our river breakup team actually started uh, planning back in December. Uh, this comprised of Alberta uh, Environment, our engineering team, Public Works, RCMP, Emergency Management. We looked at uh, the thickness of the ice as well as our normal 
uh, procedures for tracking. And uh, we really started to uh, plan on that. Did we see it coming this far? I would suggest not. Um, however, for a more detailed answer, I'll turn it over to our deputy CAO. The flood mitigation program has uh, been a priority of Mayor and Council for a number of years. And uh, for those of you who uh, are familiar with the downtown, uh, you will know that uh, uh, there has been extensive construction, particularly uh, on one end of Clearwater Drive. Uh, the road itself was uh, not actually uh, the primary purpose of that construction. Uh, it was to construct a berm. Uh, that berm is uh, the start of the work that will ultimately surround the lower town site. Uh, there are uh, other storage uh, piles uh, that uh, uh, residents uh, on uh, the southern end of the lower town site would have noticed and it's that material that will be used this construction season to build the next couple of reaches of this program. Uh, thank you Scott, thank you Matthew and thank you Mark uh, for that excellent question. So following uh, four questions, I'm going to try to group together. They're slightly different, but forgive me because I think they're related kind of the same thing. I will go to Scott for this one. Speaks to kind of our cleanup efforts and recovery. So I'm going to read out all four, Scott, and maybe we can try to answer them all the best we can. Uh, first from Gert, are there cleanup efforts starting with streets where the water has subsided completely? Mary Rose asks, is the city going to issue cleanup instructions later on? Charlene asks, as the manager of River Park Glen, how will I be contacted to ensure I get a few team members back to prepare the property for the return of current residents, as well as to prepare units for potential new tenants displaced by the flood? And another one, Scott, related to this, Amy says, re-entry timeline. So maybe you could speak to where we are in the process. We understand people want to get back into their homes and businesses as quick as possible, and we want to do that in a safe manner. So when it comes to debris management, which is a huge endeavor in its own, is part of recovery, what we're doing is what's called a, a, a spoken wheel concept. So we've broken the municipality, or the lower town site, shall I say, in seven different zones. What will happen is we'll give very detailed instructions on our MWB.ca that will indicate which the zones are, where the locations of the debris management will be, and how we're effectively going into those areas and disposing of waste. What we'll do is set up a series of uh, um, bulk containers that are broken into uh, the debris management types. So recyclables, wood, or things that just have to be put into trash. And then we'll work together with our uh, different partners to uh, effectively get those into the right uh, um, parts of the dump. The, uh, this allows us to effectively manage uh, debris management in a very quick way, uh, understanding that having uh, debris sitting out on lawns and in streets is not something that uh, we want sitting there. So by breaking them up into these seven different zones, we'll be able to manage it very quickly. All instructions we'll share with uh, the public through our usual uh, communications department, uh, the website, Twitter, Facebook, as well as uh, news releases to our media partners. Thanks for that, Scott. Thank you, everyone, for those questions. Certainly questions that are in everybody's mind right now as we prepare for re-entry the best that we can as a community. So we have about five minutes left. Make sure to get your questions in right below the video in the comment boxes. Of course, you can join us again tonight at 5.50 p.m. for our weekly telephone town hall previously focused on COVID-19 response, currently focused on river breakup and a response to this 1 in 100 year flooding event. This question is going to be for our CAO. Uh, very good question from Diane. Um, will you be allowing rebuilds in areas that are on a floodplain? So I know we're very much in the response phase still, and uh, that's our focus right now, but maybe our CAO Jamie Doyle can speak to that. Thank you for the question, Diane. And it's a very, it's a very good question, and it doesn't escape us um, as we move through this recovery process. Uh, but to be sure, we are we are going to be allowing rebuilds. However, it does beg uh, the question to be answered about 
rebuilding or development within our flood hazard zone. Uh, one great thing about uh, the, the flood mitigation program uh, that Matthew spoke of earlier is that it does allow us to develop responsibly within this uh, one in 100 year flood event. So it is a question we're consistently looking at and looking at planning moving forward, but we are going to be allowing rebuilds uh, for those areas in the downtown. Uh, thank you, uh, Jamie. You may recall in uh, recovery from the 2016 wildfire, one of the community conversations was about that. And certainly the will of uh, the community at the time, certainly the will of the community in those areas was to rebuild as safely as possible and for the community focus to be on flood mitigation. So uh, right now, of course, our focus on making sure everyone's safe, making sure we can get everybody home as quickly as possible. This next question here is from... Uh, and apologies if I mispronounce your name, Mohammed, as well as Jeff. And I think, uh, obviously, with uh, partnership with the Red Cross, that'll be uh, developed and announced hopefully today. I'm sorry, I've been on. The, we've been on this uh, on the on this uh, event here, speaking to you. I, we know there's going to be some further information coming forward, but there's also an announcement, uh, Scott, from the GOA yesterday. So uh, the que these questions here, uh, first from Jeff: Will there be financial assistance support for those paying hotel on their own? Uh, and from Mohammed, we are stuck at Edmonton with no help from the RMWB or the Red Cross. With a medical condition that doesn't allow us to return and stay in camp, where is the help paying for accommodations and food? So, Scott, if you want to weigh in on that. Thank you. As you know, we uh, announced our uh, partnership with the Red Cross today. And uh, understand that uh, looking at uh, the nature of our community, uh, the 1-800 number that has been set up, which is 1-800-863-6582 and is manned 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Mountain Time. I've requested that uh, Red Cross look at online systems, understanding some of our residents are working shift work and uh, this might the uh, those hours might not work for them. So we certainly want to work with our residents and uh, we're looking at how to activate an online portal. Uh, once that information is uh, shared with us, we'll have that posted through rmwb.ca as well as our traditional social media outlets. Uh, for the question about funding, what I would encourage is to uh, reach back out to uh, Red Cross at that 1-800 number. Uh, it was just set up and it has gone live, so you may have missed or had your question prior to the setup of the line and the announcement of our partnership. Also understanding that as of May 4th, uh, Government of uh, Alberta funding, you can find that at goafunding.alberta.ca slash emergency. Well, thank you so much, Scott, and thank you for that question. It's going to conclude today's community Q&A here on Facebook with uh, the municipality. I'd like to thank all of you for your questions and everyone in the community, especially those that are impacted by this historic event as we also uh, respond to the impacts of COVID-19. I'd like to remind everybody of our telephone town hall taking place tonight at 550. You may already be registered for our town halls. If not, you can do so at rmwb.ca or you can follow along online tonight at 550 p.m. We hope you can join us. Many of the same questions and themes will be explored again there tonight. Of course, visit rmwb.ca, sign up for our up-to-the-minute updates, follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, you can always call our Pulse line at 780-743-7000. Thanks, everyone, for joining us here today. We'll be back again tomorrow, same time, same place. Stay safe. Have a great afternoon.